has held that position since 1985. Before that, he worked in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania and Charleston, West Virginia. He is the author of several software programs used throughout the National Weather Service. And today he will be presenting a uh, webinar, which is called GIS Tools 2.0 which is a collection of useful GIS modules. And so if you are ready, Mike, uh, you do have control. And so uh, go ahead and proceed. Okay, I want to encourage everybody to put your phones on mute if you haven't done so already. Today, uh, we're just going to talk about this little software package I developed to make uh, maps easier. We'll talk about the history of it first. And then uh, I'm going to talk about these support modules. GIS Tools is basically just a collection of Python modules. And then we'll talk about the actual modules that create the maps. And then I have some examples of some scripts that we've written in Louisville that uh, generate both KML maps and ArcGIS maps. As I said before, uh, everything was written in Python and people that know me so that that's about the only language I use anymore is Python. KML Tools was created in 2008. Basically, what we wanted to do at this office was make some nice Google Earth maps. And I just uh, sat down and, and read the formats for uh, making KML, and it's really not that difficult. And so I created this little package called KML Tools. As time went on, we added other support modules just to make the task of making these KML maps even easier. Then we got involved with uh, ArcGIS, and we had a person in this office, Nathan Foster, who was a GIS wizard, and he developed these really cool models that we could use to make a precipitation. But we found out that the HMTs were having trouble running the models, so I basically took Nathan's work and uh, developed uh, standalone Python programs and after I uh, developed these programs, I noticed there was whole sections of the code that were duplicated. So I pulled those sections out and created this library called ArcLive. As uh, time went on, we noticed that uh, there were some other programs we wanted to support, and so we added yet some more Python modules. So about uh, May 2012, I had all this modules in various different packages, and so I decided to collect them all into a new group called GIS Tools, and that's where we stand now. The nice thing, thing about GIS Tools is you can use it in a shell or a Python script. So if you're not a Python person, uh, you can just stay with shell. Here's an example of uh, one of the uh, modules. What this does is it fetches data out of the Hydro database, and you can see the shell call pretty straightforward. And then below that is the, the Python script call. So let's start with the support modules. The first one is run RPF, and really uh, this is something I pretty much lifted uh, directly from the IHFS, uh, or, uh, I'm sorry, WHFS uh, people. But it just runs River Pro in, in a batch mode, gives you a little more control. And then the uh, module you just saw, get uh, IHFS data, this fetches data out the Hydro database and add them to uh, a comma-separated value CSV type file. Then there's another one, Coco Chef. It turns out that the uh, Coco uh, Ross server can actually generate chef messages per state. And so this little routine takes those chef messages and converts them into yet another type of CSV file. So I have all these different CSV files from all these different sources, and I needed a way of combining them, and uh, that's what CAT CSV does. And CAT CSV is fairly intelligent, and it can even do some filtering. And last but not least, uh, we had a problem that we were having trouble accumulating precipitation, making nice accumulated precipitation maps. And uh, I came up with this routine called Accum Precipitation that does that very thing. It has some limitations, which I'll uh, talk about later on. The first one is uh, run RPF, and uh, this is basically just runs River Pro without having to bring up the GUI. It works well inside of the scripts. And River Pro is really good for extracting dynamic data. 
data. Here's an example of, a, of just a diagram of how it works. Um, you create a River Pro PCC, and that basically tells River Pro how to run. And then you output into a CSV file, and you can see uh, the output uh, can be very, very simple. Basically, the LID, the dynamic data you need, maybe a few other fields. Trying to go to the next slide. There we go. Well, that's what happens when you push the button twice. We'll go back. Know 
where that was put into your text database, you can use this module. And again, it has to run on AWIPS. And as you can see, we use a lot of CSV files for moving data back and forth in this GIS tools collection. Not all the columns line up the way you want them to, especially from different sources. So what CAT CSV does is allows you to take all these different CSV files and combine them. And it, again, it's intelligent. It can select different columns and it can also do some filtering. Here's the diagram. So you have a configuration file, and then you have all the input CSVs you want. And here's an example of the configuration file. It's actually quite simple. You just have to say what the output name is going to be, and you have some options there. Um, you can also include a header. And then you can see on the first file, columns 0, 1, 3, 4, 7, 12, 5, and 6 in that order. And I want to use the vertical bar as a delimiter. In the second file, I want zero, uh, columns uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, and 9. And I count from 0, just like Python does. So you can take this information and you can combine it. There's what the uh, River Pro output file looked like, if you remember that. There's what the Cocoa Rods output file looked like. And you can combine them into one file. This uh, program is useful in lots of different places. Now, because there are so many options, you do have to create that configuration file, but you can use any text editor, and it's pretty simple. The nice thing about CAT CSV, it will run on AWIPS, or it will run on a PC. And uh, sometimes we'll run in both places. You have the output options as file name, delimiter. You can delete lines if they have missing columns. And you can also change DIMMs, which cause problems with certain programs, to just a blank. And uh, declare your header. Input options, you can have a file name, column numbers, the delimiter, a filter condition, and a skip header to flag. This little guy, a tune PCPN, turns out in your Hydro database, there's a magic table in there called daily PP, and it, it actually accumulates daily precipitation. So what a QMPCPN is, it's basically a query onto that table, and I created this nice little GUI interface. And that's an example of the output. allows you to have lists of spotters. So um, this little module 
to basically take your spotter database and create a file that it clears can use. And the same thing could be used in the, follow, the last module, the CSV to place. And what it does is it generates a, a plotted place map that the GR type programs use. So we'll look at each one of these in detail. Like I said, ArcLive is a library of Python modules and it just makes it easy if you're a Python programmer to create maps using ArcGIS. The nice thing about this is while the user is executing your program, they don't even know they're working inside of ArcGIS. They basically double click on an icon and in about a minute or two, depending on how fast your system is, a map will appear. Now ArcGIS has to be installed on the machine that you're running this module on. So, of course, everything has to run on a PC. So we have uh, basically two classes, one called Title Dialog, which is a short little class that just pops up a, a box for asking information, and then Arc App. And Arc App does most of the work, and we'll talk about each one of these methods that are included. Here's an example of what Title Dialog does. It, it basically just pops up a, a box and asks for a file name and a title. And this is a very common process when you're making a map, so I just thought I would make it easy for programmers so they wouldn't have to keep recreating the wheel. Now, I'm using the TK library, which admitted is pretty primitive. The nice thing about TK, though, is it comes along with ArcGIS, so you can always depend on it being there. Of course, if you're more of a advanced type programmer, you could uh, use the GTK Plus library and install that on Windows and make nicer dialog boxes. But this guy will get the job done. Then ArcApp, we're going to show you how that does all the methods for making shape files. First thing is the ArcApp constructor, and what this does is just creates an object so that all the other methods can, can operate on, and the object eventually can yield a map. The nice thing it also does is it creates a little text window, so you can write any messages that you want to to the user just to encourage them that, hey, something is happening right now. They may not understand all the messages, but at least they know that something is going on. When you're making these maps, a lot of times, again, depending on your uh, hardware you're using, the process can be very, very long, and, and so it's always good to send a reassuring message to your user just to let them know that something is happening. Setup is the second thing you would run, and this basically sets up ArcGIS, and this re Fire or request the license to run ArcView and Spatial Analyst. This little routine can take, uh, depending on how busy the license servers are, can take several seconds. Echo is just a simple way of writing a message into that text window. So the programmer really doesn't have to know anything about TK if they don't want to. They can just use this echo method. CSV to plot, again, does exactly what it says it'll do. It will take a CSV file that has latitude, longitude, and some type of data and create a plotted shape file. This one actually runs quite quickly. This is the one everyone wants to see, plot to contour. What this will do is it'll take the plotted shape file that you generated in the last step and contour it. And you have a few options on how you want to do the contouring. For the GIS wizards out there, I'm basically using the uh, topographic routines and spatial analysts to run this. And again, this idea, I have to attribute it to uh, Nathan. Auto scale is a neat little routine. What it will do is it will scan your attribute table and look for the highest value in that column, for example, precipitation. 
it will look for the highest value. And then from there, it can look through a list of layer files that you have created, and it will select the best scale. The nice thing about this is you can have these scales. You can have a scale that is very detailed for between, say, zero and one inch of precipitation. But then if when you're hit with a big event, like six inches of precipitation, it will switch to a different scale. So you don't blow uh, everything above one inch the same color. But on the other hand, if you're always worried about six inches of precipitation, you're going to lose a lot of resolution for the small events. So using auto scale, you can kind of get the best of both worlds. And uh, one of the routines in auto scale is max man. And I just thought I would expose that to the programmer. They might find it useful for something else. Shape clip uh, will take a shape file and clip it based on another shape file. And this was such a common process. I just thought I would expose it in this uh, particular package. So, for example, if you want to clip a plotted precipitation map or a contoured precipitation map to your WFO boundaries, you can do that. A lot of weird things can happen while you're running these uh, scripts. And uh, you want to catch the errors and pop up a box. Again, now the user may not understand all the aspects of the errors, but at least they know something has gone wrong and things just don't disappear. So that's what catch except does. And copy file, that does exactly what you think it is. Again, this is such a common process, I just thought I would make a nice little method to make it easy. Once you have your map, I created two methods to make it easy to check on things and, and fix bad data. First one is called pop CSV, and what this does is it basically brings up Excel with your CSV file in the right columns to make it easier for the, edit, uh, the user to look at the data and perhaps edit the data. And then pop PNG, just most of the time when you're done with these maps, you convert them to PNG so you can post them up to the web, and this just makes it easier to show the user what he's got to uh, generate it before he actually sends it up to the web. So it just pops up a, a window a, or a version of paint. So using this, what you can do is you can set it up so that anybody, even people who aren't GIS trained or don't even like GIS, can make a map. And if you set it up correctly, you can have the map generated, you can also pop up the data that generated that map and let the user look at it. So what we do in Louisville is after he generates the map, he looks at the map, if he sees something that doesn't look quite right, he can look at the spreadsheet that generated that map, fix the problem on the spreadsheet, close everything down and rerun the process. So it makes it really nice to make a good quality controlled map. ArcLive is actually being used by a few agencies outside the National Weather Service for various purposes. And since this is pretty involved, when you uh, download ArcLive, you get a 42 page programmer's guide with example code on how to make certain types of maps. So I try to make it as easy as possible. Of course, I can always probably improve that programmer's guide and with comments I'll be happy to do that with later releases. Here's some examples of maps we created in Louisville and you can see once you have the shape file and the contour file you can make it look as pretty as, as you want. You're really limited only by your imagination. Now in order to make these maps, you do have to generate what are called ARC GIS map documents. So you do have to have a little bit of GIS knowledge setting this stuff up. But once you're set up, the user doesn't have to worry about it. Going on, we have CSV decay 
XML, what this does is takes the CSV file and it can generate a very nice plotted KML or KMZ map that you can use to display in Google Earth or Google Maps. If you're using Google Earth, you can actually put multiple folders in the same map so you can include the precipitation, snowfall, temperatures, and uh, put it all into one map and then have the user click on the folder they want. The one thing that CSV to KML cannot do is it cannot contour. Here's the structure how it works. You have a disk configuration file. And you can see uh, quite a bit of uh, possibilities here. We don't want to take time to describe all of them. But uh, pretty much anything you can think of uh, as far as a plotted KML map is open to you. And here's just again the same old CSV files you can see in all along. And there's an example of the KML map that it makes. And you can see KML really is just XML for map making. And uh, we support all kinds of different options. CSV to KML has 27 different options. So you definitely have to have that configuration file. And interesting thing about this little routine is you can actually generate the KML file on AWIPS or a PC. And we've used this program for all kinds of stuff. Uh, we've even used it for plotting signal strength from weather radio uh, uh, surveys. So it's not, uh, it's not limited as far as any type of point data that you want to handle. I don't know about other offices, but we really like Claire's in this office. It's a popular English report logger, and it also takes care of the LSR generation. One of the nice features about Claire's, takes a little while to set up, is that when you have your Claire's uh, GUI up, the person calls in and gives you his name. And that is a known name in the database. You can actually enter in their report by their name, which will have their latitude and their longitude and all that stuff put in there for you. Here's an example of what our spotter database looks like. And here's what Eclairs wants to see for that information. You can see it's just basically the name and the address phone numbers, all that good stuff. This is the uh, screen capture that come out as well as I'd like, but if you look down below, you can see a little pop-up window there that says Spotter ID, and you can see I have my name selected, and so I can type in the name of this person, and you can see he lives in Scottsdale, three miles south, southeast. So it just makes it a little bit easier way of filling in live spotter reports. And it's very easy, once you have that spotter database, to keep the clairs up to date. Up to date. And this little routine will run on AWIS and a PC, so depending on how you want to handle it. Of course, the clairs have to run on AWIS. One of the most beloved set of report uh, programs from the Weather Service uh, offices are the ones created by Gibson Ridge Software. And GR Analysis and GR Earth have these files you can place point data into called place files. So I wrote a little routine that can take, again, a CSV file and generate the type of format that the GR Earth programs want to see, which he calls place files. So there's my spotter database. And there's what a place file looks like. And 
you can place all kinds of information. It will pop up a window, and it'll have the name of the person and you know phone numbers and any limitations on the times when you can call them, so on and so forth. Here's an example of it in action, and uh, it's hard to read that little pop-up box. As you can see, we popped up a box with the maybe the observer, when we can call them, what the phone numbers are, and uh, you can color those dots, and you can make them change it from dots to squares or whatever you want to do. So, again, it's very nice when you're using a DR uh, and you're tracing like a supercell thunderstorm. You have all the spotters you can call, you can uh, pop that up pretty quickly and say, okay, uh, look out to your southwest. So we found this to be very useful. Well, the whole power of taking all these individual modules is, is combining them into uh, these scripts that can do lots of different things. What we usually have to do in Louisville is, is we have to run a script on AWIPS that collects the data and then using LDAT sends it across to a PC. And then the second part is a script on the PC that takes advantage of the KML uh, or the GIS, uh, ArcGIS uh, routines and makes maps. So I've got an example of a simplified version of what we use here in Louisville. This is the AWIP site. First of all, we're running River Pro to generate the base products of what we need. You can see I have a little PCC file here I created called RP underscore all. I guess I could move my mouse and show you exactly what I'm doing here. So that's the first routine. And then I go into the hydro database and I add in the latitude longitude, and notice that I put a minus sign because in the hydro database, the longitudes are all quite positive. Draw the county and the state, and get IHFS data will automatically add the name and the detail. That's built right into it. So, oh, my cursor went away. Where'd you go? There it is. I'll go back. Probably should use a mouse. So now we've added in the data. Then I get the, the data from the Coco Ros server and then generate my uh, Coco.csv. So now I have these two CSV files, RP.csv and Coco.csv. Using CAT CSV, I'm actually doing two things at once. Back here. I'm generating separate files, yeah, we'll be fighting this, generating separate files for precipitation, max temperature, mint temperature, snow depth, and then I'm also generating a file that has all of that stuff together into one. The first four are what we're going to be using for the ARC GIS plot, uh, plots and contours. The last one is what I use for making the KML map. And then, of course, I just have to copy all these things over to LDAD. So we're done on the AWIP side. This routine is very, very fast, much, much less than a second. On the PC file side, things are a little more complicated, so I created a Python script that uh, does everything. First of all, you can see, I'm going to forget about the cursor because it's getting irritating. Uh, but you can see I'm making uh, all the KMZ files using the CSV to KMZL. And where you see the self.gui.echo, that's actually writing a message to the screen, just letting the user know that something is happening. Then we set up the ArcGIS workspace. This is the routine. Depending on how busy the servers are, they can take uh, several seconds. 
So, again, I encourage you, you definitely want to write a little message to the user, letting them know, thank you, that uh, something is happening. Now we take that CSV file that we sent over, in this case, uh, we're just using, uh, I think this is the precipitation routine, and we're just generating the plot shape file. So once I'm done with this, I'll have a nice plot shape file that has all my precipitation uh, labeled. Then I take that plot shape file and using plot to contour, and this generates the contour shape file. So now I have a plot shape file and a contour shape file, and I can overlay them any way I want to. This next, I like to clip my uh, sub WFO boundaries. I know some people think that's not good, but I like to see things clipped to the WFO boundaries. So this is a routine that does that. Now, if I remove this one line, um, you would see the, the contours would go all the way to the edge of the map. So now I have all this information, and so I take that map document which is really just a template that I created earlier, and I make the map. And so, to my uh, user there that the base map is created. Next, we correct, uh, we select the, co uh, the correct scale, and again, this is a precipitation routine, and my scales can go all the way up to 12 inches of rain. That's what that 12 is, that tells what the limit is. And then, I save my files based on what day it is. So that's what the uh, time, local time does, and it, it puts the name based on the, the date. You can see I use a month, day, year, not PNG there at the end. Now I'm ready to make my PNG file. So that's what the uh, export to PNG command does. And here is where I'm actually just using the raw call as the RPY library. Uh, there was no need to simplify this because it was simple anyway. And I'm writing a little message to the user saying that everything is exported. So now we uh, pop up the uh, PNG viewer at the very top there. So that allows the user to see the map. We pop up the CSV uh, editor so the user can see the data that went into the map. And last but not least, I copy the data to LDAD to get it ready to be our synced up to the regional server. And everything, you know, the whole block of code is in this try accept block if you're a Python programmer, that'll catch any errors. And any errors that pop up will be caught by that GUI catch accept. And the other stuff you see below that actually just sets up windows and things like that. But you can see uh, with a little bit of code, you can accomplish a great deal of work. And at this office, it usually takes about, depending on what the servers are doing, about 20 seconds to create a map. So again, GIS Tools is just basically a collection of Python modules that makes life easier for the for GIS focal point, who is, we all know has worked to death. And it takes the, 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 uh, CSV files that have all kinds of formats and it makes the ArcGIS maps and the KML uh, Google Earth type maps. And uh, I'm sure I'm going to be adding other modules in the future until there'll be a GIS Tools 3. You can go either on ALIPS or PC, depending on what is more convenient for you, and you can use these in Shell or Python scripts. So I hope. Uh, you enjoyed uh, this little introduction to GIS tools and obtaining GIS tools. I'm having a hard time figuring out the uh, S, what's that, the Software Collaboration Platform, SCP. So if you really want GIS tools, just send me an email and I'll send you the, the package. It's, it's not very big at all. And that will include the, the documentation that comes with it. So I'll be happy to entertain any questions from anybody out there. Hey Mike, can you hear me? This is Mel and Eureka. Yes. Okay, I've got a um, couple of questions for you. Um, well, three actually. Let's start with the Python. Um, Mike, I'm not too concerned with the GIS side of
of things. We've got some reasonably good GIS um, expertise here. I'm more concerned with the setup and the, the Python code. Um, we've got you know, the, the two of us that would be involved with doing that are not as maybe as Python savvy. So I don't know if you can speak to that. I know that's kind of a generalization, but yeah. There are a lot of good Python books out there, um, but if you, if you just want to make maps, if you look at the documentation that comes with GIS tools, I really do walk you through almost line by line of the process of making a, 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 a plotted shape file and a concert shape file. Okay, it sounds like you've taken care of that for us, that the Python code's all kind of embedded. Um, another question then would be, um, the you know the whole issue of AWIPS two and the transition of this over to AWIPS two when that occurs, I'm assuming I, I don't really know how this fits in with that. It shouldn't make any difference whatsoever. The the fact that it'll run on a PC or a AWIPS platform, a Linux platform, it really could care less about AWIPS two. As long as River Pro still runs, it should be completely uh, invisible. Right, that was my assumption is that River Pro dealt with that for us. So as long as that's working. Okay. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Right. Okay, so my last question then is, you know, what what you're doing here obviously is uh, point data being extrapolated onto, you know, to create maps. And, uh, you know, there's information being filled in. Do, do you know the objective uh, analysis process that's being utilized to do that? Yeah, well, what I'm using, if you're a GIS uh, person, I'm using spatial analyst, and I'm using the topographic routines. Okay, got it. All right. That's all of our questions from Eureka. Thank you very much, Mike. Very good work. Great presentation. Well, thank you. Are there any other questions? I know there was a lot of material to cover. Hi, Mike. Mike this, this is, is me. Oh, we got a tie. I think I heard the loop first. <laughs> All right, thanks, this is Steve. Um, I've uh, done a little bit of uh, implementing here, and I uh, am getting some trace back errors. Are you, are, are you willing to take a look at those uh, for me? As, as a Certainly, yeah, just send me what the errors are, um, and I'll, I'll look at them. I'll, I'll be happy to, uh, usually they're pretty straightforward. A lot of them sometimes are permission issues. Okay, so I'm sure you've seen much of these before, but. Right. And then uh, I had a couple comments in, in your instructions. Okay. Um, under the, uh, the Arc Live, uh, there's a couple areas where there's some uh, syntax stuff that's out of shape. You just want me to, uh, it starts like on page 22. Where yeah, you're, yeah, just, uh, just, you know, show me where the errors are and I'll be happy to correct them. Okay. Yeah, it's just that GUI equals ArcLib. The, the, it's a colon C instead of a C colon. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm sure there's all kinds of typos in there. Because uh, I, I had people look over it, but I'm the only Python guy in the office, so you know, okay. unless it's really obvious, they probably didn't catch it. Okay, and then just about a module, uh, wondering if uh, you've made an Acum Snow, like an Acum Precip. Uh, I'm not sure uh, if there is a daily snow type yeah, thing in there, but, but when I when I do the uh, daily uh, or replace that Acume PCPN uh, module, I'm thinking very seriously about really expanding what that thing can do, and I will include snow. Yeah, that'd be great for us up here. Thank you. Uh, I can imagine. Yeah, I appreciate your hard work. Thanks very much, Mike. Sure. Uh, who was hey, the other Mike. person who wanted to ask me a question? Hey Mike, this is Melissa in Rapid City. Hi Melissa. Hey, I was wondering, do you have anything that will take um, the LSR format and be able to use an LSR to combine it into the CSV file? No, I haven't written anything like that, Melissa. Um, but, uh, you know, that sounds like that would definitely be something doable. But I, I haven't messed with that yet. Okay, thanks Mike. But if you do, some, do something like that, uh, let me know and I can include it into the next release. Okay, that sounds good, thanks. Mm -hmm. Anybody else out there? This is Matt in 
Key West? Hey, how's it going in Key West? Going very well. Um, I just had a real quick question about the, um, uh, the GR Level 2. Uh, the, you, you, you kind of spent through that a little bit, and I just wanted to see if I could back up to that real quick. Um, sure, sure. I was wondering, um, are those are those props um, that are created, are they, they're created by Gibson Ridge, is that correct? No, they're created by you. Okay. Uh, it, it, you have software that will compile all that data together, is that correct? Yeah, it basically takes your uh, spotter database, as the case may be. It doesn't have to be a spotter database. It can be any lat log data. It creates these files called place files. And Gibson Ridge software can load place files, and that's where you see the plots. Uh, I'm with you now. I'm with you. Okay. Um, I, I've, I've done some work including place files inside of our GR Level 2 analyst before. Um, I was wondering, is there any way we can make those a... Uh, uh, make those place files dynamically updated? I know that's a little bit outside the realm of what you're covering here, but... No, I can, uh, use, I can see you do that. You, you would just have to, you know, set up a script to run that little routine, uh, and it would uh, dynamically update it as often as you wanted to do it. Okay, I got you. And that, those, those will be kicked out by your... Uh, uh, okay, I, I'm with you now. I apologize to, to ramble on there for a minute or two. Thank Not you. at all. Hey Mike, Mike McClain, can you hear me? Hey Mike. Um, got a question for you. Um, on licensing of um, ArcGIS, uh, how often do you run into conflicts when you're you're running your program uh, with uh, not being able to grab a license? And I'm wondering if uh, you know, a lot of folks are starting to use these tools for creating maps. Uh, you know, if it's going to be a problem in uh, grabbing a license. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question, Mike. Uh, I haven't run into any too many problems here yet. In fact, I actually had to change the code to request an ARC view level license and not an ARC info level license. Um, and that helped things a little bit. But that is a possibility in the future that if everybody starts using this stuff, um, we could have some license conflicts. Now, what they did in the central region is... We are sharing licenses with the southern region as well. So the, the, the servers are combined the license of all the central regions and the southern regions into one. I don't know what the eastern region has done. Yeah, well, that's the same way we do it in the western region. Okay. So, uh, but no, surprisingly enough, the nice thing about it is if you do have a license failure, it will tell you. It will actually pop up the box and it will say, you know, license failure, and then close down. So at least you won't be left in the dark. Oh, good. Thanks. Anybody else out there? Hey, Mike, this is Hunter in Columbia. Um, I've had a quick question. Uh, we think creating maps here, uh, but not near as efficient or quick as, as your uh, process here will, uh, will do. So that's, uh, that's very helpful. I appreciate you doing that for us, everybody. Um, I'm just kind of curious that all these maps you all are creating daily, what are you all using those for? Are you all posting all those to your, your external web page, or what are you doing about maps? Well, we're, we're kind of archiving them, uh, and uh, we are posting them on the top news of the day, uh, but we really need to start working on developing an online archive, uh, and so that's what our final goal is going to be. We're going to have like a place where a user could go to and if you wanted to look at the precipitation from a certain date, uh, that map would pop up. We're, we're not there yet, uh, but we're working toward that. Okay, great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Hey, Mike, this is Diane Cooper. Hey, Diane. How are you? I'm fine. I'm curious. Um, we are ingesting all the Kokoro data in the hydro base. So yes, I am too. Okay, so then why are you actually creating a separate cocoa rod file then? For offices outside my area. Oh. Uh, okay. I wanted to generate maps, plots of, of all of Kentucky, and so I didn't want to have to put in uh, all the cocoa rods for Paducah's area and Jackson's area into uh, my database. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Hey Mike, would it be possible to make your presentation available? 
Yes, in fact, I believe this is going to be recorded and placed somewhere uh, on some Met, MetNet server in the central region. I guess we'll share it with any other region that wants it, depending on if the recording came out, of course. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Hey, Mike, sorry. All the at West Gulf. Yes. I'm curious about your ARC live uh, modules. Are those essentially Python scripts? Yes, sir. Aren't they ARC objects? No, no, I, I, uh, I'm not that sophisticated. I basically uh, use the uh, the tools library and uh, some of that, uh, the mapping module. Okay, uh, the, the model builder? Is that what you no, uh, you can actually call Python script. Model builder does the exact same thing as I'm doing. It right. basically is calling the tools. Okay. So, and then there's a new one in there, called the mapping module, which Model Builder doesn't use, but it, you can actually do some really cool things with it as well. Okay. Great. But uh, I, I'm not calling Arc Objects. That's, that's pretty high level, and I'm not there yet. Okay. On your, on your CSV to uh, different format utilities, have, have you considered writing out the uh, format? Yes. Yeah. 
and I, I got a copy of it, had, had a chance to read it thoroughly, but it looks pretty good, and there's not much else out there, so uh, if you guys have a, unfortunately, it's not a cheap book, uh, but uh, you might want to have a copy in your office. I, I saw that on, on uh, Amazon the last week. There's also a new book coming out for uh, getting to know GIS 10.1. Yeah. It'll be released in February. Yeah. 10.1 for just making a, a test of change changes quite a few things in, in there. So um, we haven't looked into it, but I'm, I'm just wondering uh, how much backward compatibility there's going to be. We have to be, I think, be careful before we all switch over to 10.1. Um, they're usually pretty compatible with each other. <laughs> Not always. Okay, Mike, I have another question for Kathy. Yeah. Okay. Kathy, um, it, I, you probably said this. I apologize for missing if you did. did are, you, are these going to be recorded? Yes, we are recording them. Uh, this one's being recorded right now, and we'll check the quality, and we'll make the presentation available. And then uh, the ones uh, for tomorrow, the, all the NGA uh, GIS training will be recorded by the training center. So John okay. Ives will be doing that. And we'll uh, send out some information on the list serve once those become available. Yeah, because I have people shift working and stuff, so we probably want to cast it that way. Thank you. Okay. Is that training coming up going to be more for people that have never used GIS before, or is it to develop people like myself that have been working with it for a few years? It's all different levels. Uh, you can see from the topics there that the first topic is the basic concepts, and then uh, we shift into the topics four and five, the geocoding and the model builder, which are more um, intermediate to advanced topics. Okay, I've invited anyone from our office to attend. I'll attend all of them. Okay, and as I said, we will be recording these, so uh, we'll make those available uh, once we know where, where they'll be placed. Great.